welcome to Mosaic Monday as we embark upon teaching number 22. Uh, teaching number 22 will primarily be in the area of Luke chapter 3. Uh, we'll probably hit a few other places uh, in Matthew, but our primary place is going to be uh, Luke chapter 3. Uh, but before we begin proper this evening, uh, I want to p- throw, run a couple of things by you, two things by you. First, uh, coming up the week of weekend of September 11th, so the Sunday after Labor Day, uh, we will be going back to uh, what we call our program year schedule, our, our regular schedule on Sundays, and so that'll be a 8 o'clock traditional service, then there will be a 9.30 a.m. mosaic service, and then the 11 o'clock modern service. So Sunday, September 11th. Uh, Mosaic goes back to Sunday morning at 9.30. Again, it will be recorded, both the video and the audio, uh, for you to keep up with, but just know that'll be the shift. Uh, We'll have two more Mosaic Mondays next week and the week after, Uh, and so uh, we're coming to the close of that. Which brings me to my first consideration. Um, I would like to know, uh, you can let me know via email, including those that watch online pretty much exclusively or or listen online. I know there's quite a bit that follow us, uh, but let me know uh, via email or you can let me know as you see me around. Uh, Considering mid-October, maybe doing a Monday night class at 6.30, but on the Torah. So on Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, and it would follow the lectionary, similar to the lectionary that Jesus himself would have followed. That's why it would begin in mid-October. That's when the cycle beginning with Genesis would start. Uh, And then each week we would kind of follow through and go through the five books of Moses, um, but we would do so uh, from um, probably as far as what the church would consider a very uh, non-traditional viewpoint, uh, and that we would explore those texts of Moses kind of quite in depth, actually, and and look at things and wrestle with things uh, that normally are not uh, in a typical sermon, if you will. Uh, So we would be able to look at, like, the sacrificial system more in depth and really what was going on there and that, for instance, 80% of the sacrifices had nothing to do with blood, had nothing to do with forgiveness, uh, yet you would think, most people think that's all they were all about, and very few of them were actually about that. Uh, So we would spend some time looking at those kinds of things. So if you would be interested in that, so Mosaic would go on on Sunday mornings at 9.30, but there would be an additional time in the Word uh, that I would be leading on Monday evenings at 6.30. Uh, so if you think that would be something you'd be interested in, uh, let me know so that I know it would be uh, worthwhile pursuing and, and getting that on the, the facility calendar and all of that. The second thing is I want to do a final reminder, uh, if you will, of the upcoming uh, Christmas in the Holy Land tour. Uh, it's, it's filling up quite nice, but there is some space available. Again, that's uh, we would leave December 23rd, and we would arrive back December 31st. Uh, and there, there is still room on that to, to celebrate uh, Christmas in the Holy Land. And if you were interested, uh, there are some flyers in the back, or you can email me or let me know that you would like uh, a PDF of it, and I can send it to you. Uh, and you can invite friends and so forth if you are interested. So just want to make sure you know that's still uh, available, and you can still sign up for that. So those were the two things I kind of wanted to open with this evening. Uh, See if you would be interested or if you think others would be interested in a Monday evening class at this time, but going through the Torah. Uh, And then again, Mosaic making that shift uh, the week after Labor Day to Sunday morning. All right, so that's where we are at. Let's bow our heads and let's pray, uh, and then we'll get started. We pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we would so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, so that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we would embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given to us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
you will grab a Bible if you need one. There should be one in front of you in the pew, and if you want to keep that one, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, but grab your Bible, let's hold it up, and repeat after me. This is my Bible. Jesus is who it says he is. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the word of God. My mind is alert. By God's grace, my heart is receptive. The Bible is the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living Word of God. My encounter with the Bible today will transform and grow my faith. We say together, in Jesus' name, amen. As I said, we'll be cracking open in Luke chapter 3, uh, among other places, but that's really where we're going to spend most of our time this evening. And it's really still coming off of what began in teaching number 20, when we began looking at John the Baptist uh, quite a bit and even went into uh, the similarities with the Essenes and so forth and his clothing and his diet. Uh, and then last week, we continue to explore uh, John the Baptist. And this week, we're going to be doing that again. Last week, when we looked at John, we did so from the lens at the end from that first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, where we saw how Mark took uh, that uh, passage from Isaiah chapter 40, but then he took key words and he linked it with uh, a passage from Malachi as well as a passage from Exodus, uh, and that was kind of setting the scene in Mark's Gospel for the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And so this week, we're going to be kind of in that same spot of that launching point of Jesus' earthly ministry. And hopefully in Teaching 23, we'll get to his baptism and the inauguration of that. And then we'll finally start being able to dive into the teachings of Jesus. But this week, we're kind of looking at Luke's version, if you will, of uh, that connection of John the Baptist uh, to that prophecy from Isaiah chapter 40 and his role of preparing the way and all of that. So we're just going to look more in depth at that and explain uh, what's kind of going on there in the text from Isaiah uh, as well as other places in the prophets. Uh, and a part of it is also, some of it will be a repeat of what we did last week, but Part of our commitment in Mosaic is that by the time we're done, like we're not reading every verse in order, but by the time we're done with Mosaic and I don't know, another 150 to 180 teachings or so, that we will have read literally every word, every verse of the Gospels at some point. And so we're honoring that commitment uh, by looking kind of at Luke's version of how John was setting the scene and getting things ready for Jesus. And uh, as we kind of progress uh, this evening, kind of toward the end, there's a wonderful like wordplay that I think is so fun uh, that you can begin to, again, see uh, uh, how, how the the first century Galilean Hebraic mindset, how it liked to do literature, how it liked to write, and um, not only were the prophets of the Old Testament very big at doing this, but the gospel writers and even Jesus himself uh, are very big at kind of doing word plays. And so we'll kind of highlight one of those this evening uh, just to kind of get, in, again, get the flavor of that, that first century aspect of the gospels. So that's kind of the introduction where we're going. So let's look at our first verse we're going to consider this evening, Luke chapter 3, verse 4. Again, this is kind of uh, setting the scene. Uh, who is John the Baptist? What's he doing? What's he all about? Uh, and this is one of the things that describes him. So let's read this verse together. A voice is calling in the wilderness, clear the way of the Lord, Make his highways straight. All right, so 
here, again, this is that imagery of Isaiah uh, describing the ministry of John the Baptist, which in, in the end is really working to establish the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, the Old Testament context here is that the prophet Isaiah, Yeshayahu, he hears a voice calling for the preparation of a highway to Zion, which none other than the Lord himself will travel. So that's kind of like the context for Isaiah, that Isaiah receives this prophetic vision that there has to be this preparation for this entrance into Zion. And what you're preparing for is none other than the Lord himself to make visitation to Zion. The image that Isaiah is crafting is really that of a royal construction crew in the ancient world. They are repairing and improving the roads in preparation for an approaching journey of a king and his entourage. So perhaps they would fit very well in here in uh, Macomb in the greater Detroit area, always working on the roads, always improving things. So for Isaiah, think in mind, he has orange cone season, right? That we've got to get everything ready for the coming of this king and his entourage. And so that's the physical metaphor that he's using. But of course, it's trying to express a deeper spiritual reality that in order for this king to come, in order for the Lord himself to make this visitation, that things have to be prepared. And specifically, an individual will come and make the repairs, make the improvements, and get the road ready. Uh, in addition to Isaiah chapter 40, there's a parallel passage uh, in Isaiah chapter 62, uh, verse 10. Uh, there it says, go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up a standard over the peoples. Jewish tradition associates the voice calling in the wilderness with none other than the prophet Elijah. And John fulfills this role of Elijah by preaching his message of repentance and preparing the way of the Lord. Many of those souls who received John's baptism of repentance, who embraced John's teachings about returning to the Lord, about getting their heart right, uh, about kind of making what was crooked straight, many of those actually go on to become followers of Jesus. And in many ways, that's where John's ministry, not just John prepares Jesus, we'll get into that later in a Mosaic class, but John does prepare Jesus, but he also prepares the future followers of Jesus. In fact, at least four, you can argue for more, but at least four of the 12 apostles were originally followers and students of John the Baptist. Uh, and so his school of disciples eventually become followers and disciples of Jesus. And for that reason, among many others, followers of Jesus considered themselves and early on called themselves the way, followers of the way. That's one of the earliest known descriptions for individuals who follow Jesus as Messiah. They were known as followers of the way. Uh, they were the way of the Lord that John had prepared. And Targum Yonatan, our good friends, the Targum, those Aramaic paraphrases uh, that predate the first century, offer the same kind of interpretation of Isaiah 40. Uh, Targum Yonatan says, Prepare the way before the people of the Lord. Cast up a highway in the plain before the congregation of our God. Therefore, the voice of the one calling in the wilderness came to prepare the congregation of God. So let's keep reading in Luke chapter 3. Let's read together verses 5 and 6 as we continue to hear Luke's description of John and what John's doing and what John is about. So John is this Elijah figure uh, that the prophet said that before that great day of the Lord that Elijah would appear and for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, Elijah in Jesus' generation is none other than John the Baptist. So he's that voice that's getting things cleared, getting people's hearts right with God. And then it continues. Let's um, 
read together these two verses. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be made low. The rough ground will be made even and the ridges will become a plain. All flesh will see the salvation of God. And uh, what's really fascinating there is that that phrase, the salvation of God, is found throughout Isaiah, throughout the prophets, throughout the book of Psalms, uh, the salvation of God. But if you read that in Hebrew, it's Yeshua Elohim. You hear it, Yeshua, like his name, Jesus' name is right there in that, that all flesh will see Yeshua. They will see Jesus, the Jesus, Jesus the one sent from God. Uh, and so here in this verse, the raising of the valleys and the lowering of the hills, it's not really intended to be literal. Uh, the prophet Isaiah and the other prophets, when they speak in this language, speak very metaphorically. They speak and write in just amazing, grandiose poetry. Uh, the prophecy is employing figurative speech. Uh, one thing, it's talking about the removing uh, and the uh, removing of obstacles and the removing of difficulties. It's actually a, a Hebraic idiom uh, that to move a mountain is to remove a difficulty or obstruction. Uh, and we, we kind of have similar things in, even in English like, you know, if you're going to do that, you might as well move a mountain or something like that. Like, or that's like a, a, a hill to climb, right? That, that's too big a hill to climb. Right? We, we don't mean literally, we're not talking about going and climbing a hill. If we say, that's too big a hill to climb, we're kind of speaking metaphorically, poetically, that that may be a task that is too great either for you as an individual or too great for us as a group right now. Uh, and so we kind of use it that way. And uh, John is, is being described that way. But also, you have this idea in the language, right, that that which is lifted up, that which is high, is going to be made low, right? And so there is already an idea that Jesus is going to expound upon, especially in Matthew chapter 5 with the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and that is the re in order to be ready to receive the kingdom, in order to have that vessel fitting so that Jesus and his teachings and the Messiah, the kingdom of heaven, is going to be able to pour into you, uh, the greatest obstacle is our ego, our very high view of ourself, our very high view of our intellect, our high view of our power or our accomplishments or our ability or our craftiness. We are very often our own worst enemy. And so the first step in receiving the kingdom of heaven, the first step in making the, the, the road straight for this great entrance of the king into Zion is for our egos to be made low. Right? And it's, it's, that's the sense that Isaiah uses it. As I said, when we finally get to those teachings of Jesus and we look at the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus is all about getting the ego under control. And so it's a very important concept that John has in front of him. Uh, that's part of how he's going to prepare the people. So in preparation for the coming of the Messiah, the final redemption, the high must be made low, the low must be made high. This is what I would call the kingdom of heaven's inversion principle. Uh, you know, again, when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, just look at what's blessed, right? Blessed are the weak. Blessed are those who are mourning, right? It's all the things we would not associate with blessing, right? It's the small things. And then uh, the Sermon on the Mount's about becoming smaller, not bigger. It's about becoming more humble, not more exalted or greater. And that's an important part of the kingdom of heaven, this process of inversion. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 20, verse 16. The last will be first, and the first will be last. Or Luke chapter 18, verse 14. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be uh, exalted. That's a, a verse that I pray almost every time before uh, I preach when I you see me I go up to the altar and pray a little bit or you may see me bow my head before 
a time of sharing the word of God, I actually pray Luke 18 verse 14 uh, to remind myself that the proclamation is about God. The proclamation is about God's word and that as much as humanly possible, I need to be out of the equation. Can't be about me. Can't be about my personality. It can't be about what kind of suit I'm wearing. It can't be about anything except the word of God. That's the most important thing. Uh, so um, uh, then you have Matthew 20, beginning in verse 26. Jesus, whoever wishes to become great among you will be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you will be your slave. That whole idea of servant leadership. What makes a person great in the community of Jesus is their willingness to serve. Their willingness to serve without recognition. Their willingness to be uh, humble. Uh, preparing the way for the kingdom of heaven requires this, what would seem from our point of view, an inversion of values and priorities, a complete turning upside down of things. And so in that regard, we often speak of the kingdom of heaven as just that, turning things upside down. But the reality is this, is that it's through our sin that the world is currently turned upside down. And the valuing of appearance and the valuing of power and the valuing of control and the valuing of anything that our ego teases us with, that that is a result of the world being upside down. And so rather than seeing, as we'll go through in Mosaic, Rather than seeing Jesus and his teachings and his way and the gospel message as turning the world upside down, rather it's turning it right side up. It's already upside down. It's the kingdom that sets it right side up. But from our perspective, it will feel like he's turning things upside down. But in reality, he's setting them the way they're supposed to be. And it's helping us Return, that's teshuvah, repentance, helping us return to God to reclaim that part of ourself, that true self, that self that's within all of us that was created in the image of God, that spark of the divine that exists within all of us because we were created in God's image, right? To return that to the forefront. That's the kingdom of of God. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is about Jesus the Messiah entering into this world to restore us to our true self. You see, our true self, our foreign self, our self that's alien to God, right? That's not us. That's outside of us. That's not how we were created, right? We were not created with that. That came after creation. That came after the fall. It's so the kingdom of heaven is, is the work of God through his Messiah of restoring paradise. And so John's role is to get people's hearts and minds ready for that. And in many ways, as you can see, even with John, John was his generation's Elijah. Every generation has these Elijahs that get people ready, that open the vessels, that cause the hearts to turn and return to their God so that they can then experience, by God's grace, the transformative, transfiguring of the kingdom of heaven in their own lives. And so that's John's role there. Now let's quickly flip over to Matthew chapter 3. If you want to flip over in your Bibles there to, to Matthew chapter 3. Almost hit it there. All right, Matthew chapter 3. And we'll look at verses 1 and 2. And again, this is uh, much the same as we've been seeing, but we have a commitment in Mosaic that, again, by the time we're done, we will have, un we will have looked at literally every single word that's in our Gospels, all four Gospels. And so uh, let's read this together. This is Matthew's kind of version of introducing us to John the Baptist, describing John the Baptist and what he's about. So we read together. In those days, John the Baptist arose, and he would call out in the wilderness of Judah, saying, Repent. 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So again, a clear allusion to the Isaiah 40 passage as well as Isaiah 62 and Micah and Exodus. It's all still there. It's what we saw in Mark chapter 1. It's what we just saw in Luke chapter 3. We see it again here in Matthew chapter 3. Um, it goes on to instruct John, or initially in um, uh, Isaiah's context, Elijah, or the Elijah figure, um, to uh, get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. So you see that there. I have it kind of bold and italicized for you. Uh, in Hebrew, that's besora. Basora. This is uh, literally the word that we get gospel from. This is where we get the so-called good news. This is its Old Testament context. Right here in Isaiah 40 that Mark 1, Luke 3, Matthew 3 are all speaking about. This is where the so-called good news comes from. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift up, do not fear, and say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Right? That's the good news. The good news from Isaiah that he says is going to come is that the people are going to hear proclaimed from Zion, proclaimed from Jerusalem, proclaimed from the land of Israel that God himself is right here. None other than God himself has visited you, right? That's the good news, the visitation of God. And this passage, again, as I said, is, is the source concept of the idea of the gospel. Jewish tradition considers Elijah to be this herald spokesman of Isaiah 40, coming and proclaiming the good news of the Messiah's arrival, heralding it loud and to all in Zion. From the apostolic perspective, uh, from the New Testament perspective, John the Baptist, the Elijah who was to come, is the one who proclaims the good news of Jesus' arrival. Targum Yonatan uh, translates or tra paraphrases Isaiah 40, verse 9, this way. Here is your God. Behold, the kingdom of your God has been revealed. And so there in that pre-first century commentary on Isaiah 40, verse 9, it clearly associates this good news of God's presence among his people as nothing else than the kingdom of God. Uh, almost identical with the way that John proclaims it with repent for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. And so now I want to talk a little bit about this message of the gospel, the proto-gospel if you will. The gospel was being preached in Isaiah. The gospel was being preached in Ezekiel, and it was using those words, the besora in Hebrew, but if you look at the Septuagint, the Greek translation of Isaiah 40, verse 9, it uses oengelon, or the evangelical, the good news, the Godspeed, right? So the gospel is being proclaimed hundreds of years before Jesus is born. And the gospel is being proclaimed by John the Baptist before Jesus' ministry, much less his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension have occurred. The gospel is being proclaimed. So what is this gospel? What is this gospel? Clearly, Isaiah was not going around preaching to believe in Jesus of Nazareth that he died on a cross and rose three days later. That's not what Isaiah was preaching, at least not directly. Yet we know from his own words he was preaching good news. And we know that John comes in the tradition of these prophets, being a prophet himself, the, the last of the great prophets, proclaiming the gospel, good news. Mark chapter 1 even begins that whole time when it starts talking about John with the words, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what is this gospel? That proto-gospel, that original gospel, 
are those nine words right there in bold. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the gospel message for every prophet of the Old Testament. That was the gospel message given to Adam and Eve in the garden. That was the gospel message of John. That was the gospel message of Jesus. And that is the gospel message Jesus tells his disciples to take to the world. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? The kingdom of heaven is here. That's the good news. Now, obviously, as we begin to unpack that and as now we are on some 2,000 years on the other side of that and we have seen how Scripture has been filled full with Jesus, of course we begin to see and understand how his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension all are part of the gospel. But that original message of John that was to get people ready And that original message that Jesus took from John and proclaimed himself were those nine words. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? Uh, You can even look, for instance, Jesus in uh, Matthew uh, 3, verse 2. John is declaring, repent, for the kingdom of heaven uh, is at hand. But then Matthew chapter 4, Jesus preaches, quote, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John has it on his lips in Matthew 3. One chapter later in Matthew 4, those same nine words are now on Jesus' lips. And then in Matthew 10, when Jesus sends out the twelve, he tells them this. Quote, proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the proto gospel. Repent. Kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what's this repent part of the gospel message? It comes from uh, the Hebrew word teshuvah, uh, the root of that being shuv, uh, the three-letter root being shuv. uh, And it's a foundational concept, uh, meaning to return to God, and even more so, not only to Turn or return to God, but also return to God with a, a vigor of being committed to following his word. Both the Hebrew word teshuvah, the Greek equivalent metanoia, imply not only a change of mind, right, but a literal turning around and going the other direction, uh, a 180 degree turn. Um, in the mouth of the prophets, Repentance means to return to God, but more specifically, to return to God's ways, to return to God's will, to return to God's thoughts, to return to God's actions. And ultimately, as we're going to see in the teachings of Jesus, to return to who you really are as a child of God, who you really are as an image bearer. That's teshuva. It's not just saying you're sorry. It's not just admitting that you've messed up. It's not just saying I won't do that again. It includes all of that. None of that's excluded. But more so, it's about a commitment to return to God. And by doing so, you are returning to your authentic being as an image bearer of the creator of heaven and earth and rightfully then taking your place as an image bearer in this creation and becoming a partner a junior partner a very junior partner but nonetheless a partner with God in creation that's how it was always designed it was always designed that God's final act of creation last in actions first in thought very important principle for biblical interpretation What's the last action of creation? Human beings, you and me, right? And that's what it was all about. And it was ultimately all about partnering with God in this creation, experiencing and seeing God's glory. That's repentance, turning to that. And the good news is you can do that. Why can you do that? Because the kingdom of heaven, The kingdom of God is here. 
It's not out there. It's not up there. It's not over there. It's not almost here. It's not almost within my grasp. It's not one more step away or one prayer away. It's actually here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the apostolic scriptures, the term kingdom of heaven refers to the messianic error. When, we were, uh, when we're in the church, we often can think of the kingdom of heaven as a paradise in the sky or beyond the sky. And we can hear the word heaven and think of the pearly gates and the golden streets. But kingdom of heaven is the same as kingdom of God. And the term refers to the reign of Messiah. Specifically, the reign of Messiah in a physical sense. But as our good friend Rabbi Lichtenstein explains, it also applies to the spiritual regeneration that's anticipated when the Messiah is physically ruling on earth. That is, for those who repent, for those who do teshuvah, those who turn and return and commit and live by the rule of the kingdom, in this present age, they will have already, in some sense, laid a hold of the kingdom of God. It's kind of what I would say a now, but not yet reality. The kingdom of heaven refers both to the external state when Messiah comes and rules, and rules physically and in person from Jerusalem, but it also refers to an internal state, internal to you and to me and to every individual, or at least potentially in you and me who has experienced the spiritual regeneration of the Lord. It's a both-and scenario. And so John's message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, means that this messianic error, that it's commenced, even if it seems small right now, even if it seems like a mustard seed, even if it seems largely hidden from our eyesight and there seems to be so much evidence to the contrary that the kingdom of God is in our midst, Nonetheless, it has begun, and we can already begin to experience it, even if it's only at the beginning internally. And so John is urging people, when he calls them to repentance, he's really causing the, calling them to repent and to get ready and to experience this inner transformation so that when the physical reigning begins, we will be in the right place. And the Hebrew word for at hand, you hear that the, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is near in some translations. The kingdom of God is at hand in other translations. It's coming from the Hebrew word karav, karav. And that does not imply that there necessarily has to be any distance between that which is coming near and that which is being approached. In other words, we can make the mistake again that the kingdom of heaven is something futuristic, that it's something in the future. But as we're going to see in Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of Luke when we get to his sermon on the plain, not his sermon on the mount, but his sermon on the plain, Jesus tells us the kingdom of God is where? Within you. Within you. And so Karav, when it, lit, when it says the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that there doesn't have to be any distance between that which is coming and that which is being approached. Uh, that is, the kingdom is not something that's purely future. It has a future component. It's a both and. Is the kingdom of God here and right now? And can we experience it right now? Or is it something that's going to come when Jesus returns? Yes. The answer is yes. It's both. It's both and. The reality is, is the Hebrew word here leaves the correct concept of present tense, that it's now and it's ongoing, that it's begun the process. You can think about it when you go um, uh, and, and you go to something where it's announced that this is now commencing, right? This is now beginning. Well, most of the time, there's still stuff that comes after the announcement of the commencements, right? Uh, it's not completely done. It's begun. And that's what's being announced here. John's good news is basically saying, look, stop doing the behavior that's contrary to what's revealed in God's word. Work on your ego. Turn around. 
Go a different direction. Return to God. Learn what God has created you to be. Return to that true self because the king is already here. And the messianic era has already begun. And so we can begin to experience it right now. Now let's flip back over to Luke chapter 3. Let's read together uh, verses 7 and 8. Um, this is John the Baptist. He's at uh, Bethany beyond the Jordan, as we saw uh, last week on that map. you got the Sea of Galilee up north. The Jordan River comes out at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee and goes south. And just before the, the Jordan River dips in, jump, dumps into the Dead Sea, there's that area where John was doing his ministry, uh, doing his baptizing. He's there. We, we talked about how people were coming from Jerusalem and other places, and they were making their way down to hear John's message and to become part of his movement by being baptized and by taking on his baptism of repentance. And so Luke 3 is kind of giving us his version of what was happening at that place, Bethany beyond the Jordan. Uh, so let's uh, read together, uh, beginning in verse 7. He said to the crowd of people who were coming to be baptized by him, You children of vipers, who enlightened you to be rescued from the coming wrath? So then produce the fruit that is fitting for repentance. In other words, John didn't just receive anyone into the waters of repentance. When people approached him seeking baptism, it's clear from this passage that he would often turn them away and encourage them in first to go produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The word fruit is an idiom of the Hebrew language. The word fruit, especially when it's used in a religious discussion, uh, in rabbinic literature, and even in apostolic teaching in the New Testament, fruit refers to a person's outward action refers to what people can see, right? If I tell you that's a lemon tree and you go and get oranges off of it, you're going to say, uh, I'm sorry, but um, oh, that's not a lemon tree. Well, how do you know that's not a lemon tree? I told you it's a lemon tree because I have oranges. That's how I know it's not a lemon tree, right? How do you know a person is in Christ? How do you know a person is experiencing the kingdom of heaven? by the fruit you pluck off their tree. Notice the oranges don't make it an orange tree. It's an orange because it's already an orange tree coming up out of the ground. Your works don't save you, but they do let us know about what's inside of your heart. They do know, let us know what seed has taken root and what is sprouting in you. Right? And so fruit in rabbinic literature and first century thought is always associated with the outward actions associated with your inner faith, right? What you believe eventually will manifest itself. Even if you lie and cover up all kinds of things, somewhere, somewhere along the line, what's really going on inside of you manifests itself in an exterior fashion. And so John is saying, look, this isn't for everyone. So before you come in here and before you are going to take upon yourself this yoke, right, we'll find out more about yoke when we get to that part of Jesus' teaching. Take my yoke upon you, right? But well, before you take on my yoke, John says, um, I, I want to see if you're an orange tree or a lemon tree or a lime tree. So go out and, and manifest this. Show me who you are. Uh, and so he refers to the unrepentant as the offspring of vipers. You brood of vipers, you children of vipers. Very common slur in the first century, uh, usually thrown from one religious caste at the other religious caste, uh, each viewing themselves as a brood of vipers. Um, and he chastised them for supposing that somehow by coming here, they might escape the coming wrath. In other words, that 
by coming there, they didn't really have to change their behavior. They didn't really have to change who they are. And this can even apply when we think about being part of a, a faith community today. Some people have the notion that, well, if I take the membership classes, if I check the boxes, if I'm seen there, if I make myself sit through the services and so forth, then I'm probably pretty good. And John's message would be, uh, no, actually no, right? That's, that's not what it's about at all, right? It's something quite different. So he's like, you just coming out here to be part of this because your friends are out here or because you think maybe it might be legitimate, but you don't really want to change who you are. You don't really want to change how you make decisions. You don't really want to change and turn and return. Well, you, you're not going to escape anything. This isn't a get out of jail free kind of card, right? That word and faith, action and faith, that they must work together. Okay, and so John is, is, is telling him that, and then as he's telling him that, he comes to uh, this verse that has a beautiful wordplay in it. So John tells them again, he's saying, look, you coming out here in and of itself isn't going to do anything, right? And then for those of you uh, who think because just because you're children of Abraham, just because you're, you're Jews from Jerusalem, just because you're Pharisees from the school of Hillel or Shammai, or just because you're Sadducees and your father sits on the, the Sanhedrin, or just because you're a priest or because you're the son of a high priest, right? Uh, just because you have a connection to Abraham, don't think any of that's going to help you. That's not what's going to help you. And so let's read what he says here in verse 8. He says, Read together. Do not imagine to yourselves and say, Abraham is our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up sons for Abraham. Beautiful, beautiful play on words that we don't catch in English, but we'll see it. So John is warning those who haven't yet made that teshuvah, that return, and that commitment to bear fruit in keeping with God's word, uh, not to rely on anything, not to rely even on the merit of the patriarchs. Uh, this is because part of what John and eventually Jesus kind of take issue with in their generation was uh, first century Judaism's tendency to invoke the righteousness of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as a way to compensate for their personal or national shortcomings, much the same way uh, a Christian today might try to invoke uh, a saint and the saint's spiritual accomplishments to somehow cover their lack of accomplishments. And John warns the individuals against thinking that just the merit of Abraham could exonerate them from their own personal responsibility, that their relationship with the coming king, the coming Messiah, has to be a real, personal, living, vibrant relationship. Uh, so imploring God for grace on the basis of his relationship with Abraham, while there's some biblical concept to that, uh, for instance, after the sin of the golden calf, Moses turns God's wrath away by reminding him of his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it gets greatly exaggerated to the point in the first century what John and Jesus are running against is what I would call cheap grace. And we run into that again even in the church today, this idea that uh, cheap grace for uh, maybe someone that's in the Christian tradition would be, well, Jesus, I believe Jesus came and he died on a cross for my sins and he rose again three days later. And so my life really doesn't have to change a whole lot. I really don't have to have a life that's in keeping with the teachings of Jesus. After all, he died to forgive my sins, so um, I'm sinning, so that's clearly what he died for. And so I can just kind of keep on sinning because he's just going to forgive it. That's what he loves to do. Uh, so if he loves to forgive me, I love to make him happy. So let me sin some more so he can forgive me some more. And we kind of just use the cross as cheap grace. And it isn't coming out of a place of authentic faith or an understanding of who Jesus is or who Jesus would be calling us to become after having been forgiven by grace and through faith. And so that concept existed in the first century as well. I'll show you a couple of instances from it. 
This is from the, the Midrash Rabbah. Rabbi Levi said, In the hereafter, Abraham will sit at the entrance to Gehenna. This is the equivalent of St. Peter at the pearly gates for Christians. And he will permit no circumcised Israelite to descend therein. So here, instead of Peter at the gates to heaven, Abraham is at the gates of hell. And he's there to make sure that nobody that's circumcised gets in. Doesn't matter what they really believed in life. Doesn't matter how they lived their life. Doesn't matter if they repent. Doesn't matter anything, right? Other than they're connected to Abraham, so they're not getting in. It's cheap grace. Another place uh, in Tractate Erevim. What does the passage that says, quoting Psalm 84, passing through the valley of weeping mean? It means that there are some who are sentenced to suffer in Gehenna uh, in hell. But our father Abraham comes and brings them up to himself and receives them to himself. Again, in other words, doesn't matter about their own personal faith. All that matters is that they're genetically connected to Abraham. Therefore, they're good to go, right? So John says, you know, that, that's not going to... It's not going to make the grade here out here in the wilderness. That's not what I'm all about. Uh, and so then he says, God can raise up sons or children of Abraham uh, from stones. Uh, what's, what's he getting at? It's a word play. And I, I, you can look at the two Hebrew words. So stones is avanim. But if you look what's underlined in avanim, it's the same word for sons, which is pronounced banim. Um, when, when you have it at the beginning, it makes a ba sound. When it's the, not the first letter in the word, it makes a va sound, but it's the same letter. So, but do you see how the word sons is inside of the word stones, right? So he's saying it's, it's a play on words, like um, that God can make banim from avanim, right? Um, and it's also connecting to an ancient oral teaching in Judaism that even when, when God does great acts, that even the rocks praise God, that even they begin to speak uh, and understand God as their creator. So it's kind of playing on that, but it's really that beautiful kind of word play uh, that I thought was worth drawing out for your, your attention there. So let's keep uh, reading here in Luke chapter 3. Let's read verse 9 together. The axe has already been placed at the root of the trees, and every tree that has not produced good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Right? John's pretty hardcore, right? He's, he doesn't mince any words, uh, and so you get a, a better idea also of why he's not in Jerusalem in the temple <laughs> preaching, uh, but he is out in the wilderness preaching uh, because uh, those, those cushy congregations up in Jerusalem, uh, they don't like their preacher preaching like that. So he isn't going to last too long up there. In fact, preachers that preach like this often lose their heads, so to speak. So John here is not only comparing certain individuals, but here he's kind of looking at Israel as a whole. The status of the spiritual nature of where Israel is. And he's comparing it to an orchard of fruit trees. And he says that this coming of Messiah, um, that it's a double-edged sword, right? Has lots of awesome things about it. But it also has a side to it that cuts, like, and cuts deep. That it has a judgment side to it as well. And so that when this messianic error has begun, that... The axe is ready to chop down and burn any trees in the orchard that are not producing good fruit. This teaching of John actually reappears in one of Jesus' teachings. In Jesus' parable to illustrate his warning in Luke 13, verse 5, that unless you repent, you too will perish. Um, it's in uh, Luke 13, verses 6 through 9. And Jesus takes this part of John's teaching about a man who had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it, didn't find any. So he said to the vineyard keepers, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any, right? And how many years was Jesus' ministry? 
three years. And when we get to this passage in Mosaic more fully, we'll talk about the symbolism of the fig tree, why Jesus chose the fig tree, where the fig tree appears in the prophets and so forth. But Jesus is basically saying, for three years I've been with you folks. For three years I've tried everything under the sun. For three years I've done miracles. For three years I've, I've healed people. For three years I've been compassionate. For three years I've taught truth. For three years I've done any and every Everything my father has sent me for, and yet I haven't found any fruit on this fig tree. Why is it even using up the ground, he asks. And Jesus gets the answer in the parable from the, the, the owner of the fig tree and says, well, let it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it, and I'll put around fertilizer, and maybe it'll bear fruit next year. If not, then cut it down. In other words, there's still grace, there's still time. That's the ultimate definition of grace is time. Time is what God has created and allowed into our three-dimensional space and time for us to get our act together so that by God's grace, through the working of the Holy Spirit, we would repent. Right? And so even here, uh, Jesus allows for one more year. And then... We'll look at this verse. We'll wrap it up here real quickly. Uh, let's read this together. So the people are all there. Bethany beyond the Jordan. John's preaching. John's had a very kind of convicting part of his uh, speech. And so obviously whenever uh, a good sermon has been preached, uh, a question that should pop up in the minds of the hearers is, okay, you got me. I bought it. I believe it. Amen. So now what? Right? So let's read together. The crowd of people asked him, saying, What then are we to do? He answered and said to them, Whoever has two tunics should give to one who has none, and whoever has food should do the same. So they're asking, look, okay, we get it. We get you're calling us to prepare. You're, you're calling us to turn and return. You're calling us to a commitment to God's way and God's will. What's that look like? Practically speaking, John, give us concrete examples. Talk no more theology. Talk no more abstract. Talk no more pie in the sky. Tell us in clear steps what we're supposed to do for this. And so John does that. This is what the fruit looks like. What are the fruits of a good tree is what they're asking. And so what he basically prescribes is the acts of loving kindness, of kesed in Hebrew. Uh, the man with two tunics, give one to the one without a tunic. The one who has extra food, give to the one who has none. Um, there's also a hint of the lifestyle practiced not only at Qumran down south there in the wilderness among the Essenes, but also what the early church preached in Acts chapter 2 when it said they shared all things in common, meaning where one was lacking, they provided, and they worked to support one another as a community. And so it's all about acts of loving kindness. But uh, we'll quickly look then. So then they say, well, okay, we sort of get that, but that's still too abstract. So then the text says, tax collectors came to be baptized. And they said, Rabbi, what about us? What are, what are we supposed to do? And he says to them, do not collect more than you're required. In other words, here, John doesn't say, well, oh, you got to leave your job you got to leave your job, become a monk, and follow me in the wilderness. you got to do things exactly like me. He doesn't tell them that. And even especially for tax collectors who were seen as betrayers of the Jewish people because they were taking Jewish people's money, giving it to the oppressing government regime, Rome, that was oppressing the land of Israel and robbing them of their freedom, robbing them of their own land. You're taking our money to give to them, but how you make your personal living is you overcharge us and you keep the difference. You give to Rome what they ask for and then what you overcharge us, you keep. So not only are you supporting the, the oppressive regime, you're stealing. And John doesn't say, well, quit that. He just says, do it the way you're supposed to do it. Collect what you're supposed to collect, but don't 
collect any more. In other words, here we have what Luther would get into in the Reformation, the sanctity of vocation, that whatever you do for a living, wherever you find yourself in this world, you can still do it in a way that is glorifying to God, is worshiping God, and is bearing fruits of the kingdom of God. How you conduct business, how you treat your customers, how you treat others, right? That You can do that even as a tax collector. And then, of course, it goes on and it's like, well, the soldiers are like, well, that's fine and good for the soldiers. What about us? What are we to do? And he says, don't agitate anyone. Uh, Don't exploit. uh, And let your compensation be sufficient. Here, John would not be speaking to Gentile Roman soldiers. John's ministry did not extend to that. Uh, Jesus will be the one who takes that and extends it into that realm. Here, John would have been speaking to soldiers, Jewish soldiers, of Herod Antipas, right? And what these soldiers could do is they had the authority of Rome behind them. So they could intimidate people. They could make sure they got their way. Maybe they go into a restaurant and they say, you know, I'm not going to pay my tab. And if you do something about it, well, I'll strong arm you and I'll make things very difficult for you. So don't agitate them. Don't exploit them. And let your compensation be enough. What you get paid, you don't have to take from other people. They could often use their position, to, again, to extort people. So John doesn't say, oh, you can't be a soldier or, oh, you can't serve Herod Antipas. He just says, Do it the way you're supposed to do it, right? And then you can begin to see the practical advice even for us. Where God would have us, where God has placed us, there we're to bear fruit in keeping with the kingdom of heaven. Okay? No matter where we find ourselves, from soldier to tax collector or whatever it is, you can kind of see how John's answer is fitting that. But notice he never tells them, Sell, you know, you got to become a desert wanderer like me. You got to abandon your family or don't get married or you have to live in this colony on top of Mount Masada or whatever like that. Uh, He doesn't tell them any of that. Keep doing what you're doing, but do it with acts of loving kindness. That will become a major theme in the teaching of Jesus, why I'm mentioning it here Um, that idea of mercy and loving kindness becomes a very important concept throughout the teachings of Jesus. So we're kind of getting ready now to enter that phase in Mosaic. So we'll end there this evening. Next week, we'll pick it up probably uh, with the baptism of Jesus and talk about that. Uh, And then essentially the launching of Jesus' public ministry here on earth, which would then begin to get into his teachings, his parables, the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer, all of those things will begin to start uh, being able to unpack from this first century Galilean perspective that those first 23, 24 teachings kind of primed the pump for. All right. So we'll be ready to really hit the ground rolling when we get into Jesus' teachings. All right, well, let's uh, bow our heads. Uh, let's close with the blessing. Blessed are you, Lord God, who has given to us the gift of the Holy Scriptures. Amen. Go in peace. Shalom, shalom.